Hey everyone, Victor is here and in this video I wanna go over a few more mass spec problems. If you haven't seen my previous videos on mass spectrometry and the McLaughlin rearrangement, you might wanna start there and then come back to this video to uh, do a little bit more practice. Alright, let's jump in. So the first molecule that I have here is a 2,2-dimethylhexane and this molecule has a molecular formula of C8H18 and the molecular weight of 114 atomic mass units. Looking at the spectrum of this molecule, the mass spec on the right side, I am not seeing the molecular ion because molecule is probably not stable enough, so we don't even register that. So let's see if we can identify any other peaks that we have on this spectrum. So the very first thing that jumps at me right away is that I have a quaternary carbon right over here, which means that our fragmentations are going to be around this carbon because that would be a position for a carbocation that is comparatively stable. So the first fragmentation that I have here, I'm going to just chop off a methyl group giving me this uh, tertiary carbocation C7H15+, and that one has the molecular weight of uh, 99. And looking at our spectrum, yep, there it is, I have the uh, peak at 99. Likewise, if I look at the next place where I can break this molecule apart, that would be right over here, giving me another tertiary carbocation. That one has the molecular weight of 57, and we do have that peak as well. And typically within the scope of uh, our course, we don't usually focus on any smaller chunks that have the molecular weights uh, around 40 and below, so stuff that we have over here is probably not really going to be relevant, and I don't usually see instructors asking for the identification for those tiny chunks. So with that in mind, let's move to a slightly more complex example. Here I have sacbutyl methyl ether, or uh, methoxybutane if you like. This molecule has the molecular formula of C5H12O with a molecular weight of 88. And look at that, we actually do have a, the molecular ion peak for that one. It's a very small one on the right side, but nonetheless we do detect that guy. Then, looking at my molecule, I see that I have a secondary position, secondary carbon, next to an oxygen. So the electron pairs that I have on my oxygen can potentially stabilize the carbocation, meaning that if I do a fragmentation over here, making the following resonance stabilized carbocation with the molecular formula of C4H9O+, that guy is going to have the weight of 73, and we do have that one in the spectrum. Likewise, if we cut the molecule from the other side, over here, we're going to have the next molecular ion with the uh, formula C3H7O, and that one has the molecular weight of 59, and we see that signal as well. And like before, I am not going to look at the lighter ones at around 40 and below. So far so good? Well, then let's take a look at the next example. We have 3-hexanone over here. The molecular formula is C6H12O, and the molecular weight is even 100. And looking at my mass spec on the right side, I can see that I do have the peak at 100, so we do detect the molecular ion peak. Now, in this case, we have several different uh, potential places where the molecule can break up during the mass spectrometry. First one is going to be over here, giving me a resonance stabilized carbocation at my carbonyl with a weight of 71, and we do have that signal as well. Next, we have uh, the split that we can do on the other side of our carbonyl, giving me the following uh, carbocation with the molecular formula C3H5O, and that one is at 57, so we see that signal as well. Then, one other thing, if you have seen my previous videos, you would know that we can also have a McLaughlin rearrangement in this case, and McLaughlin rearrangement is also going to give us a chunk at 71, so that is also a piece that we are seeing over here. We also do have this huge peak over here at 43, and if you are curious, that one is actually a propyl carbocation, which we are going to have when we take this orange carbocation that we have over here 
and we'll lose CO from that, so that one is going to give us the carbocation at 43. But as I've mentioned, usually we don't look at those smaller pieces. And before we go to the next example, here is something fairly important that I want to point out. As I've mentioned before, the biggest limitation of the mass spectrometry is the fact that you are just going to get the numbers. So this signal over here at 71, we did predict that that signal is going to be there, but is that going to be mainly orange carbocation, or is that going to be the product of the McLafferty rare arrangement? Well, that is a good question. Unfortunately, mass spectrometry alone cannot give us that answer, so that is that. Which means that as an analytical tool, mass spectrometry is pretty good as the confirmatory technique where you already have an idea of your structure and you see uh, what molecular pieces you can predict that structure is going to fall into, and based on that you see if you can find those pieces in your mass spec, and then you have a pretty decent confirmation that probably that's that molecule. However, if you just have the spectrum and you don't really have much of an idea of the structure for your molecule, looking at the spectrum alone can be quite a challenge and usually it's not really going to give you a structure if <laughs> ever at all, especially for bigger molecules. So here is an example of a mass spec of a molecule where things are not as simple as they might seem. We have methyl butanoate or butyrate if you like, and that one has the molecular formula of C5H10O2 and the molecular weight of 102. Do we have the molecular ion for that? Yeah, it's this tiny little guy on the right side, but we do have the molecular ion for this one. Then, we have multiple different uh, fragmentations that are possible for this molecule. First of all, I'm going to take off my McLafferty rearrangement that's going to give us this piece, giving me the uh, ion at the molecular weight of 74, and we do have that guy, so we, we can see that in our spectrum. Now, the next one is going to be this fragmentation where I'm going to chop off my methyl group and form this uh, carbocation with an oxygen. And while normally we would not consider an oxygen with a positive charge and only six electrons around it as an anywhat stable species, we actually do have resonance stabilization in this weird looking carbonyl. And since we are already talking about the high energy compounds, those things things can exist in mass spec quite comfortably. And that one is going to have the molecular weight of 87, and we do have that signal as well in our spectrum. One could argue that instead of uh, this species, we are just losing the methyl group right over here, but practice shows that usually in the case of the uh, esters like that, we are going to see this rather exotic carbocation, although, as I said, losing the methyl group from the edge of the molecule is a possibility as well. Now, do we have any other fragmentations here? Well, yes. We can also break uh, CO2 from our molecule, giving us this uh, propyl carbocation, and that guy we're seeing right over here at 43. It's the one that I've mentioned last time, that usually we don't look at those guys, but, you know, once in a blue moon, your instructor might ask you to identify what that signal at 43 is, and 43 is a classic propyl group. Then we also have this fragmentation, which is going to give us a resonance stabilized carbocation again at 59, and this guy is right over here. And finally, we can also come up with a fragmentation when we chop off the methoxy group, giving us this acylium carbocation, and that guy is going to show up at 71, and that is precisely where we see it. Now, we also have a few other fun signals here. We have this signal at 55, we also have a signal at 15, which is actually just the methyl group that we are going to get after we lose CO2 from over here. We've got uh, this guy at 26. So, as a practice, you can try to come up with reasonable chunks for all of those peaks and see if you can come up with something reasonable. And if you can, let me know in the comments below. And of course, there are a few other unique type of rearrangements and fragmentations that we do occasionally see in mass spectrometry. We can see things like the retro deals all the reaction, we can see uh, two carbon chunks flying off, aromatic compounds, and so on. There is actually quite a few of those. But for the most part, within the scope of a regular introductory organic chemistry course, we are going to expect students to be able to predict the fragmentations which result from the formation of the most stable carbocations, 
plus the McLufferty rearrangement. So those things are must know, and for as long as you practice those type of fragmentations, you should be able to predict most chunks in your molecules on the test or in your homework. And as always, thank you for watching. If you like this video, remember to boop the like button, and I'll see you next time.